consider taking up singing. Yeah, I believe you'd be good at it. Yeah. Listen, I need to do something. Come down here. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Um, oh, just want to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus right now, I thank you for a hedge an angelic hedge around Anessa. I thank you for divine protection. I thank you that the 91st Psalm belongs to her, lest she should even dash her foot against a stone. Every plan, every strategy, and every operation that is devised by Satan is now destroyed, made null, and void. And Lord, we thank you for her covering, for the angel of the Lord that campeth round about her. And Lord delivers her, protects her at all times, in all situations. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, praise God. You can be seated. I looked at several things and prayed tonight about what to share with you. And um, the Lord brought me back to this. I know, I know this is what he wants me to share with you tonight. Um, why don't we go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I want to talk to you tonight about the, the ministry gifts. I want to talk about not just one of them, but kind of give you an overview of all of them. Because you need to know, you need to understand the difference in the gifts so that you, on a personal level, will be able to uh, expect and to draw from the different gifts. You know, if... Uh, you have to first have understanding. You've got to have knowledge before you can have faith. And if you uh, don't have faith, if you don't understand, if you don't know the gifts, then you won't know what to expect and what to draw from, from the gift. Remember what the woman at the well, uh, Jesus told her, he, because uh, uh, he said, give me to drink. And, of course, she was a Samaritan woman. But he went on to tell her, he said, woman, if you knew the gift of God, that's a principle. If you knew the gift of God, if you knew who was standing here, you'd be drawing from me. You'd be asking from me. You'd, you wouldn't be trying to get water out of a well. You'd be trying to get the water out of me. Amen. If you knew. But what if you don't know? See? And the Bible's given us many gifts. But if we don't know the gifts, how are you going to draw from the well that's on the inside of them? Amen. So this is something that we as believers need, but the church needs this. Uh, when, it, when we talk about these five, we call them five ministry gifts, and the reason we do that is uh, uh, to designate them from the nine gifts of the Spirit. Um, <clears throat> but we know what we're talking about here, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But in, 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 and what I want to do first of all is I want to talk about how these gifts are alike. They are different. If they weren't different, you wouldn't have to have five. Right. You know, you just have one. But since they are different, then we need to know the differences. Yeah. 
Uh, first of all, and, and, and first of all, let me, uh, let me, the best illustration I can give you is this, a baseball team. On a baseball team, everybody on that team handles the ball. Everybody throws the ball, right? But there's one guy who throws it more than anybody else. And who is he? The pitcher. The pitcher. Amen. We know that everybody catches the ball. If you can't catch the ball, you don't need to be on the field. But there's somebody that catches it more than anybody, really. And who is that? Catcher. That's the catcher. Amen. Well, what about batting? What about hitting the ball? Well, everybody hits the ball. So there are certain things when it comes to the five ministry gifts that they all do. They have, they have similarities, but again, they also have their differences. Now, first of all, all five of these gifts, all five of them, it takes a divine call from God. You cannot go into the ministry, not what we're talking about, not, not the ministry of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. You can't go into any of these without a divine call. Look at what he said here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. Well, you can start with 27. He said, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. The body of Christ is the church. The church is the body of Christ. But, but I want you to know here that he is writing to a local church. He is writing to the church at Corinth. And he said, and God has set. Now, who set? And God has set. The word set means to position. It means uh, to appoint. Uh, it means to ordain. It says, and God has set some in the church. Not all. Not everybody's this. But God has set some in the church First, everybody say first. first. Now that was God's choice. And there's a reason why he first, he said apostles. Did you see that? If you'll notice every time ministry gifts are mentioned, every time he always starts with the apostles. When he talked about the foundation that the church is built upon, he said it's apostles and prophets, not prophets and apostles. It's always apostles first. And so he said first. Now the word first in, in the Greek is proton. And it just means what it means. It means, well, I say this, everything above second. <laughs> first, you know what it means. It's first in, uh, first in rank. Amen. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets. All right. So who, who did God set in the church second? Prophets. prophets. And thirdly, teachers. So who's the third gifting that he put in the church? Now, notice that after he did that, he did not say fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. Notice what he said. He said he set some in the church. And notice they are set in the church. And remember that he's talking about, he is talking about a local church. Amen. It's not just the church universal. He's talking about a specific church. He's talking to that church. It applies to all churches, but specifically at this time, he's writing to the church at Corinth. And he says, after that, everybody say after that. See, because now he said, because see, look, if you don't have apostles and you don't have prophets and you don't have teachers, then guess what? After that is not going to be there. There is no after that. Notice what he said after that. After what? After apostles, after prophets, after teachers. Now what? After that. Okay. What happens after that? Miracles. Gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. But now, so we got miracles, we got gifts of healings, we've got helps, we've got governments, and we've got diversities of tongues. So do we need all this in the church today? But can we have it without the first three gifts? No, you can't. Amen. You cannot have it. See? But what I want you to see is that when, when it says that God is set in the church, that that's, that's what it means, that God has divinely called and set people in the church. Now, what that means is this. It means that you don't go into this ministry. You don't take, try to take a place in ministry or take an anointing on you just because there's a need. Right. Amen. Right. 
See, God supplied the need when he gave us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But just because we see a need, that doesn't anoint us to go and fill that need. Amen. As a matter of fact, remember Paul said, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God is the one that provides all our needs. You know, some people will come to church and they think that you're supposed to supply all their needs. I can't supply everybody's needs, and you can't either. But God has made provision for the church that if all the ministry gifts in the church are activated and functioning in their place, then people will have their needs met. Amen. Uh, that is spiritual needs. You know what I'm saying? All right. So he says, so it's no, it's, you don't go because of a, of a need. You don't go because somebody called you or somebody else wanted you, wanted you to be. Uh, we, had a, we had a couple here a few years ago, and um, uh, the, the, lady, uh, of the, <laughs> the lady of the house <clears throat> uh, wanted her husband to be a pastor. Boy, she wanted it real bad, and she worked for it, and she pressed toward it, and 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 even even uh, to the point that we made a place for him, you know. But the problem was he was not a pastor; he couldn't do anything. He, I mean, he was he was totally dysfunctional. He was out of place. He was trying to be a pastor because she wanted him to be a pastor, and he couldn't do it. Amen. Uh, you don't you don't go into the ministry just because somebody prophesied over you and told you that you were called into the ministry. Um, we could show you if I had time. We'd go to Acts chapter thirteen, and uh, as they ministered to the Lord and prayed, there was prophets and teachers in the church, and the Holy Ghost said, "Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work wherein I have called them. Where I have called them, I have called them." The church just out just was an outward expression of what the Holy Ghost had already done. So they prayed for them and sent them out. But see, the Holy Ghost had already called them. The Holy Ghost had already separated them. And so when you start getting prophecies, then prophecies is not to give you direction or tell you what to do. Prophecy is simply to be a confirmation, see, for, uh, for what God has already said to you. And you know you've heard me say this many times. If you're getting a word, somebody says, I got a word for you, or, or somebody prophesies over you, if it doesn't witness with anything that God's already said to you, then forget it. Amen. Now, here's another where I see a lot of people missing it when it comes to the, even in the apostolic camp today. Some folks think just because they're called, their spouse is automatically called. Now, what I mean by that is they think because, well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, God called me to be an apostle, that must mean my wife is a prophet. No, it doesn't. I said, no, it doesn't. When God calls one into the ministry, whether it's the male or the female, amen, then they, they are both called, but that doesn't mean they both function in that call the same. Amen. See, you can't take somebody that is not gifted to stand up uh, to minister and doesn't have that anointing to speak. You can't take them and make a minister out of them. Amen. You can't do that. You just It's going to be hard on them. It's going to be hard on the church just because a person is the spouse of somebody that it is called. Now, many times God will call both of them, and they'll both have that gifting. They'll both have that anointing. I've drawn the parallel sometimes that, uh, for instance, when I'm teaching the elders, I'm teaching the ministers down in Nicaragua because, see, there a, a lot of them don't know. They, matter of fact, this question came up. I was really answering a question. Uh, they wanted to know about, about this very thing. And I said, well, here's a good comparison. I said, here's, a, here's Apostle Jonas. He's called to be an apostle. Now, here's his wife, uh, and she helps in the church. She teaches. And she's a, she's, a, she's a pastor in the church, see? But I said, on the other hand, here's my wife, and she's not a teacher, and she's very quiet. I said, she's just as called as I am, but, just, but the role is different. Just, and, see, and so I was comparing Geraldine to Rhonda, and uh, see there, so that the people could see the contrast. Because see, we had ministers who were trying to put pressure on their spouses to enter into ministry, th thinking that because I'm called and I'm anointed as a, as a gift, that you are too. But that's not true. Amen. We shouldn't try to make people to be things when they haven't called to be that. As a matter of fact, all of the, these minister gifts have an anointing. 
And have you ever seen anybody that wasn't anointed? Have you ever tried to sit and listen to somebody that wasn't anointed? That's a mess, isn't it? Amen. It's kind of trying, it's about like listening to the lady one time that thought she could sing. I mean, when I started off, we were in a, in a church and uh, it was a new church and, uh, and the lady that was over the church were trying to please everybody, make everybody happy. So we had all these new converts coming in to get saved and, they, and everybody wanted to do something for Jesus. Well, most of them wanted to stage, you know what I'm saying? So she wanted to sing. She wanted to sing. So, the, the, well, we call her pastor. She wasn't really a pastor. But anyway, the bishop of the church let her get up to try to sing. Oh, it was paralyzing. It was terrible. It was awful. I mean, it, it, you, you imagine the worst case scenario that you can think. Go back to your worst experience ever in church and, mul and multiply it times 10. And you still won't be close to how bad this woman was. I mean, she... Uh, I mean, she could not carry a tune if you wrote tune on a piece of paper and, and, and put it in a bucket and ask her to talk. So, so what am I saying here? I'm saying that here she was. No, no, no. You got to understand, she just wanted to do something for Jesus. And, um, but you, just because you want to do something for Jesus doesn't mean that you're called. You know, we can, just because you want to do something doesn't mean you're called to do it, see? Amen. It takes a divine call from God. And if, listen, and if, if, if God's going to call somebody to preach or minister the word of God, then he's going to call somebody to listen. Right. He's going to call somebody that needs it. Yeah. He's going to call somebody that needs to hear it. Amen. Yeah. Now, you see, I remember years ago, you've heard me say this. I used to be in what we would call itinerant ministry. I went around preaching in churches. I wasn't a pastor or anything like that. But I just, people would call me to come preach for them, and I'd preach what we call revivals back then. It wasn't really revivals, but we called it that because that was the really religious thing to do. So I would go preaching, and I always preached different than everybody else. My message was always different than everybody else. Uh, and I would, I would go in and, and share. Uh, used to be, first of all, it was the, uh, the, the faith message. And nobody in this part of the world heard the faith message. So when I went in and started preaching the faith message, most of the people just sat there. But there would always be one or two or three, maybe even four in some churches that would just come up to me after the service and, you could, and during the service. I mean, they could just like leaning over, you know, they were hungry. And I knew I was feeding them. I wasn't feeding anybody else. I mean, they were getting blessed, but, but I was just feeding the, them. Well, see, and I used to think to myself, why does it? Because everywhere I went, it was like that. Sometimes it might be just one, depending on the size of the church. Sometimes two. See, sometimes three or four. And those were the people that I was there to feed and to minister to, okay? And they would really draw from the gift that was in me at the time. Well, I kept thinking to myself, why doesn't somebody build a church that feeds the hungry people? You know what I'm saying? What I didn't realize at the time, and I'm, I now realize, God called me to minister to the remnant. My ministry is not to everybody. My ministry is not to the world. Hello? See, my ministry is to the remnant. You say, what is the remnant? Remnant means leftover. <laughs> See, y'all are a bunch of leftovers. <laughs> See, y'all ain't the main course. You know what I'm saying? Y'all just, just what's left over. He's called me to the remnant. Now, what is the remnant? You know, after the, after the spirit of religion sweeps across the nation from one end to the other, uh, then, then, then there's a remnant that's left that wouldn't go. There was a remnant. There's always a remnant. God's always got a, a remnant. He's always got, remember, remember Gideon's army? I mean, he started out with, what, 10,000, wound up with, what, 300? It was because that was his remnant. Amen? The, could I tell you this? The crowd never changes anything. Right. Right. They never build anything. They never establish anything. It's always the remnant. And God called me to minister to the remnant. The um, uh, the conference that we're going to in Miami, Apostle Jones's conference uh, this month, as a matter of fact, is called Gathering of the Remnant. It's an opportunity for remnant people to get together. Why? Because they think differently. They need to hear a different message. Hello? You know, if you're going to minister to the remnant, you don't need to try to get them saved. They're already saved. Amen? They need something more than that. You know? I, 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 I was thinking about today, I've gone to ministers' conferences, ministers' conferences, 
and they would have ministers get up and preach. And the ministers would just preach a message on faith or a message on hope. I remember one of them preached a message on hope. And I'm thinking, man, you're not preaching to your people. You're preaching to preachers. I don't need you to preach me a faith message. I preach faith messages. Are y'all listening to me? Don't, don't get up there and just, you know, take somebody's tape and listen to it and outline and get up and talk to me about it. Man, I want to hear from God. I'm in the ministry, man. The devil's trying to kill me. I'm in warfare. Give me something that I can take back and whip him with. Come on. I didn't mean to get into all that, but it's true anyhow. Amen. You know what the, what the problem is? These guys weren't called to minister to the remnant. They had no revelation, understanding of ministering to, to the remnant. All they thought was they just need to minister to the, the crowd. Amen. So that's why you'll never really get fed. You'll hear some good stuff, good stuff, but you'll never really get fed. Not the remnant. Won't. The remnant won't get fed watching TV preachers because they're not preaching to the remnant. They're preaching to the crowd. Amen. All right. So you, 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 I'm talking about the, 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 the similarities. Okay. So each one of them have a divine call. Number two, they are, every one of them are gifts for the perfecting of the saints. In other words, I don't care if you're an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, your, your, commit, your place in the church. Notice he said he set some in the church. We'll talk about evangelists and outside the church in just a minute. But we're talking right now about in the church. He set some in the church, see, in the body, okay, in God's structure, in God's, in, in God's governmental operation, see. And so uh, our purpose here is for the perfecting. One translation says the full outfitting, see, of the saints. In other words, no, nobody sends, no, uh, trains a, a soldier and sends him out to battle without equipping him, without uh, outfitting him. Amen. You know, giving him a helmet, giving him uh, a rifle, giving him the training that he needs to win, to be successful. Well, that is the purpose. That is what the ministry gifts are all about. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Number two, and I'm talking about all of them. Uh, this, I'm talking about the similarities now. Number three, all three of these gifts are evidenced by the anointing. In other words, there's an anointing on them that you, that you can pick up, that you can draw from. That, listen, an anointing that can be imparted to you. Many years ago, uh, most of you weren't here, but I had a lady to come and speak with us one Sunday morning. And uh, this woman was a, a, a pro prophetic lady. And her husband came, and her husband got up and was sharing some of the product that they had for sale, you know, tapes and books and so forth. And, you know, he was a very eloquent speaker. He was a much better speaker than she was. But he wasn't anointed. See what I'm saying? Now, when his wife got up there, she wasn't nearly, uh, from a natural standpoint, she wasn't nearly as, as uh, eloquent a speaker uh, the, uh, as he was, but yet she's the one's got the call. She's the one's got the anointing. She's the one that you can draw from. Amen. All right. So uh, every one of these calls takes an anointing from God. Each one of these, this is very important. Each one, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teacher, each one of these is a speaking gift. And the reason I say that is because there are now people who are coming up and saying, well, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm a prophet, you know, but I don't preach from the pulpit. No, you're not a prophet. Hello. All of these gifts are ministry gifts in, in ministering the Word of God. Amen. Every one of them are speaking gifts. They have an anointing and a gifting to, to, to preach like we call, we call it pulpit ministry. Amen. All right, so now if anybody to be called into the ministry and they're different, everybody's experience is different, but there's got to be a strong conviction. In other words, to go into the ministry, you don't go into the ministry because, well, you know, I want to be a preacher. I want to do this. I, want, I just want to do something for Jesus. And um, 
Well, that's good that you want to do something for you. There's plenty to do. Amen. But, you know, if you're out of place, you're not going to be a blessing to yourself or to anybody else, you know. And so uh, <clears throat> every one of these gifts are speaking gifts, but you don't go into the ministry unless you've got a strong conviction. Now, what I mean by conviction, all of us, if we're born again, we know what it's like to be convicted of our sin. You remember? You remember the day you got saved? You remember what you felt inside? You, you remember something was just pulling on you? I mean, it even affected your body. Your heart was going like that. You remember that, T? I mean, there was such a pull. It, we, we call it, remember what we call it? Being under conviction. That's what we call it. Well, same thing has to be true if you're going into the ministry. It takes a strong conviction. Why does it have to be a strong conviction? Well, if it's not, you'll bail out when it gets rough. <laughs> and not only now after the conviction and after you have uh, uh, accepted it, then comes a witness. So you've got to have a conviction and a witness. Amen? Amen. Okay. All right. Now, before we get into these ministry gifts, the five of them, we're going to talk a little bit about five of them. I wish I had my whiteboard in here, but I want us to, uh, I'm trying to paint us a picture so we can see more clearly than we ever have, actually. The Bible talks about bishops. It talks about elders. And then it talks about apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So let's start and talk about what a bishop is. The word bishop is the Greek word episkopos, and it means overseer, okay? So then uh, a, a bishop is an overseer. Now, the word used in the New Testament was used in relationship to those people who were over ministries or over churches. That is an office. Bishop is not, listen to me, Bishop is not a spiritual gift. It's an office. You getting it? It's an office. You can be a minute, you can you can be a ministry gift and not be a bishop. Not be an overseer. You see what I'm saying? So you can, be, you can be an evangelist, but not necessarily be over anything. You're not a bishop, but you're an evangelist. You can be a pastor. Now see here, this, this is what really begins to mess with our head now. Because we have had it drilled into us that the guy that is the bishop is the pastor. That's not necessarily true. The pastor is a ministry gift. You see what I'm saying? So just because he's the bishop of the church does not make him a pastor. He could be an apostle. He could be a prophet. He could be a teacher. And he could be uh, an evangelist. Philip, the evangelist, was the bishop of over his house, which was a church. Are you getting it? So then when we talk about bishop, we're talking about an overseer or superintendent. See, for in, in this house, I am the bishop of this house. I'm the bishop, meaning that I'm the bishop over the whole thing. I'm the overseer of the whole operation. Okay? But then we have... People, we have things broken down in different uh, ministries and different departments, see, and they themselves have. Now, see, for instance, right now, Oasis. Well, in Oasis, you got uh, Orlando, you got Brother Bill, you got T, and they, they are the bishops, see. Now, Bill is a, is a pastor, Orlando is an evangelist, and T is, I have no idea what he is. <laughs> The verdict is still out on him. No, there's a lot of pastor in him. I, I, you know, I, I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to prophesy to you. I'm just, you know, I'm just, you know. 
But, but, but I, I, because, uh, and we'll get into a little bit more of this in a little bit. But see, that, y'all are oversee. Y'all oversee that thing. I don't. So y'all are the bishops over that. Now I'm the bishops over, I'm the bishop over y'all. You know, that's the way this thing works, okay? But then also, let's talk about, did you ever, did you get that? Was that clear to you? Okay. All right. Then let's talk about the word elder. The word elder comes from the Greek word presbyteros. And it, that's where we get the word presbytery. Elder, a gathering of, a gathering of uh, elders is called a presbytery. See? All right. It's, it's not, it's a presbyterus, I believe is the name, really the Greek word, the way you pronounce it, presbyterus. But anyway, an elder, when you, t uh, an elder doesn't necessarily mean they're, the, they're a bishop. See, an elder can just be, because what, when you say elder, you're, talk, you're, you're referring to their maturity. You know, their seasoning. You know, they've been around a while. They've experienced some stuff. They got some wisdom. That's an elder. As a matter of fact, you can't prove to me in Scripture that an elder has to be an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. It could be somebody in the church that's not called to one of those gifts, but yet they are an elder in the church because they've been in, they're mature enough, you know, that you can draw something from them. See what I'm saying? So you've got the, the bishop, okay? Now, see, in this situation here again, just for the sake of uh, uh, reference and understanding, I am the chief bishop. I'm also the chief elder. But I'm not the only bishop and I'm not the only elder in this church. Amen. And so then we come down. We've had got, we talk about the office of the bishop. We talk about the maturity of the elder. Now we have to talk about these five ministry gifts. Okay. And um, in the church, he said, now in the church. Everybody say in the church. In the church. God set these in the church. Okay. So let's go over to Ephesians chapter 4. And you know what's there, but I don't want you to get out of the habit of reading your Bible. <laughs> That's why we don't put it up on the screen. Are we doing all right? I think we can get, I, I, I don't think, I think we already passed that part now. Okay. Thank you, Larry. Um, Verse 7, he says, but, everyone, every, but to every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of, of Christ. So every one of us means every one of you. Every one of you is given grace, right? According to the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto men. I always have to point this out because somebody may have never heard this before. But the two most important words in these passages here that I'm reading now is when and until. And the reason, of course, is it says when he ascended on high, he gave gifts to men. And the reason you have to say that when you're teaching it is because there were apostles that were with Jesus. There were prophets. John the Baptist himself was a prophet. There were prophets in the Old Testament. There were teachers. The Bible talks about teachers. There were pastors or shepherds, see? And so you have all of these ministry gifts. You can already see them in the Bible before Jesus ascended on high. But the ones he's talking about here are different from all of those. Because the ones that you see here are the ones that were given to the church when Jesus was raised from the dead. And he didn't, he wasn't raised from the dead but one time. So then just because Peter, James, and John were apostles of the Lamb did not mean that they were, this, we call this when he ascended on high. That's where we get the word ascension. It means to go up. And that's why we call them ascension gifts. That's the gifts we're talking about today. We're not talking about Old Testament gifts. We're not talking about gifts that were here when Jesus was here. We're talking about ascension gifts, apostles. All right, now let's just look at this. Here you got Peter. 
Peter was an apostle. We know that. He was an apostle of the Lord Jesus. He saw Jesus in the flesh. He walked with him. He ministered with him. He was handpicked. He was trained by the Lord Jesus Christ. But he was not an apostle of this order because this order didn't exist. So when Jesus ascended on high, Peter, who was an apostle of the Lamb and was and is and always will be, he has to transition from being an apostle of the Lamb to being an ascension gift apostle. You see? See, he was, because why? He was, when, he was, when he was an apostle of the Lamb, he wasn't even born again. See, when he was following Jesus, he wasn't born again. He wasn't filled with the Holy Ghost. See? He was, he was apostle of the Lamb, but he was not an ascension gift apostle. So then once, once Jesus raised from the dead and he gave these gifts, one of the gifts that he gave to the body of Christ was of Peter. You see what I'm saying? Because, see, there's different ranks of apostles. Jesus is called the apostle and high priest of our profession. Well, he's in the highest ranking of all. Nobody climbs to that level. Amen. Then the 12 apostles of the Lamb. I'm not, a, I'm not an apostle of the Lamb. There is no such thing as an apostle of the Lamb. There's only 12 of them. That's it. Amen. That's it. There won't ever be any more. See? But then there's the ascension gift apostles, and we have thousands of them. Are you listening to me? So that's why it's important. That word when is important when you're teaching this or studying this. So he said then, he gave gifts unto men. When? When he ascended on high. Verse 9, now that he ascended, you know also that he first descended to the lower parts of the earth. Tenth verse, he that descended, the same also that ascended up far above the heaven, that he might fulfill all things. And he gave, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till, everybody say till. till. That's King James, but really we say it until, until. Why is that important? Until we all come in the unity of the faith. Well, let me ask you this. Is the body of Christ in unity? Do we all believe the same thing? Hmm? No, we don't. We absolutely don't. One believes one thing, one believes another. That's why you've got 597 denominations. Hello. Because somebody took one little part of the Bible and built a denomination on it. That's not unity, is it? But he said until we all come to the unity of the faith. To come to the unity of the faith, we all got to know the same thing before we can believe for the same thing. And of the knowledge of the Son of God. That is a revelation of the Son of God unto a perfect, that is a mature man. So is all the body of Christ mature? Are all the Christians mature? Well, see, he said until. See, some people say, well, these ministers have been done away with. Well, what you're saying is then that the, the body of Christ is in total unity. We all have a knowledge and we're all mature. Until the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. So then Christ, listen, listen, listen. So Christ then is fully manifested in the earth. That's what you're telling me. No. See, Jesus was the body of Christ. Now we're the body of Christ. All you got to do is look at the life of Jesus and you can see Christ in manifestation. Okay? You should be able to look at the church today and see Christ in manifestation. But if you don't see that, then we still need these gifts. Once we get there, we won't need these gifts anymore. Right? But we got to have them until. Everybody say until. Okay. Till we all come to the measure statue of Christ, and and and, and do we hit, until we grow up to where there are no more, no more children tossed to and fro. See, that's where we got to come to. All right. Now, let's start. I want to. I just want to briefly give you some things that will help you uh, to be able to recognize these gifts. Look, because this one is the most familiar to us. Let's start with pastors. The word pastor means shepherd. A shepherd is a pastor. A pastor is a shepherd. Um, 
They are called, they're gifting. They're gifting. Now, I've already shared, the, they, they, they do the same things the rest of them do to a degree. They preach, they have a call, they have an anointing, so forth and so on. But uh, they're called to love and nurture God's people. Now, does that mean that the rest of the gifts don't love? No, it doesn't. No. But the love of God is going to be more, I don't, I don't know if I want to say manifested, but it'll be more evident in a pastor. Because a pastor, and now if, if a person is a pastor or a shepherd, then that means there has to be sheep. Isn't that right? <laughs> Amen. A shepherd doesn't shepherd uh, nothing. He shepherds something. Remember in Psalms 23, the Lord, David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He's talking about God being his shepherd. That means David said, I'm a sheep. And sheep have needs. And my, my shepherd takes care of my needs. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. See, the pastoral ministry, they like things peaceful because sheep like things peaceful. Sheep are very, uh, I had the word when I was meditating this, but they're, uh, they get spooked easily. Sheep do. You, you got to handle sheep uh, differently. You can't drive them. You can't push them. Amen? You can't yell at them. <laughs> you can't. You, <laughs> They, they have to be led. They don't like, they don't, want, they don't want anybody bringing them up the side of the river. They want to go where the waters are still, still waters. They like green pastures so they can eat and lay down. They like things peaceful. They don't like to rock the boat. So then, because the sheep are that way, the shepherd has to have an anointing and a grace to know how to handle the sheep you know, without running them in the river or, you know, or killing them or something like that. But now every once in a while the shepherd has to, you, if you got a sheep that's real ornery, won't behave and keeps running off for the sake of the sheep, for the sake of the sheep, you have to break his leg. And so the shepherd carries the little sheep around in his arms until the leg is healed. By that time they developed, huh, come on now, I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> By the time that the sheep's leg is healed, the sheep has gotten such a close relationship with the shepherd, he won't ever run off again. Amen. I think some of y'all looking like you need a broken leg or something like that. <laughs> but now, now see, pastors, we talked about this. The pastor doesn't necessarily mean that you're over the church. You're the bishop of the church. So in the church, you may have many pastors. Not just one pastor, many pastors. Well, what's the pastor going to do? Well, in the church, the pastor is going to help watch the flock. He's going to tend to the flock. And, um, you know, sheep need, you have to watch it. They need a lot of attention. So, so let's think about it. And they nurture, they nurture. So then the pastor is going to visit the sick. Isn't that right? They're going to tend the sheep. That's what it means to tend the sheep. So they're going to they're going to visit the sick. They're going to go to the uh, they're going to preach the funerals because they are going to comfort. They're going to help in that capacity of being there with the sheep when the sheep need them. All right. Now there's sheep in all of us. All right. Because David said, "The Lord is my shepherd," so he's saying, "I'm a sheep also." we're all sheep. We all need a shepherd. That's why Jesus is our chief shepherd. Amen. Amen. But, the, but the ministry of the pastor, now see, Bill is the pastor here in this church, and, I, and, and uh, a lot of times when he does something, I know that um, T helps him. They all go together and do stuff together. You've been over to see Orlando several, things, several times together. Well, that's a pastoral heart. You see what I'm saying? That's a pastoral heart. Because because they want to they want to make comfortable they want to bring peace they want to nurture they want to 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 
protect and to strengthen. Matter of fact, let me give you some words that are associated with the ministry of the pastor. And just remember, I'm trying to make this real clear. You may have somebody that's called to be a youth pastor with an anointing to minister to youth. I sure ain't got that anointing. <laughs> my, my anointing for teenagers, because I've been back there a few times, <clears throat> is, uh, wouldn't be good. <laughs> you know, you, you, I can't, I mean, when they start bowing up at me, <laughs> uh, you know, you gotta, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, but, but some people have that anointing. You see what I'm saying? They have an anointing. That's why you would have a, you, in some churches you might have a, a somebody with a, with a, has got a, a, a pastor, the pastor of the young people, a pastor to pastor the children's ministry, pastor to pastor, uh, oasis. And then what, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Depending on the size of the church, you may have multiple pastors. All right, but now here's some words that you associate with uh, pastor. And that, of course, is shepherd. Nurture is another word. Tend. You have to tend to the sheep. Right. Um, there's all kind of things. There's, I, I read, a, there's a book about a, a shepherd and a sheep that I read, and you know, sheep, uh, they'll get parasites and all kinds of things, and the shepherd has to be there um, and to anoint them. You know, do you remember what David said? You anoint my head with oil. He's the sheep. You know, God's the shepherd. Um, and you have to anoint them with certain uh, oils and ointments, you know, and, and keep them from dying with disease and sickness and with parasites and all this kind of stuff. So you have to tend the flock. You have to feed. You have to feed the flock. You lead them out to pasture, but then there may be times when you just have to feed them different foods depending on what might be going on in their body at, at that particular time. Comfort is another word uh, for, that goes along with the pastoral ministry. Lead. Well, of course you lead people. You lead uh, to, the, to, the, to the food. You protect them. Sheep have to be protected and guard. You have to guard sheep. Um, Nice is a word that you would probably attribute to uh, the pastoral ministry. Still waters, green pastures, patience. Patience is, is a virtue of, uh, of the ministry of the pastor. Uh, patience and long-suffering, uh, counsel, counsel and compassionate. See, see they benefit the whole church. Because, see, if I'm an apostle, so my view of the people in the church is not the view that a pastor would have. Because the, so the apostolic ministry, and, and I, don't, I, I look like I'm going to run out of time. I don't want to, but I haven't gotten to the apostolic. But the apostolic ministry puts a demand on people. It makes people uncomfortable. Because to have to change and have to grow is uncomfortable to most people. And they don't want anybody or anything making them uncomfortable. And a lot of things that the pastor does. So what happens? Like in this church, you've got me, the apostle, who is not looking at the congregation as sheep, I'm looking at them as sons and daughters. Sons and daughters have to be taught. See, sons and daughters have to be disciplined. They have to be chastened. They have to be corrected. You see? So as the apostle, that's what I have to do. I have to keep order. See? That's why I need the ministry of the pastor so when it seems that I'm coming across hard, harsh, and heavy, then you've got the pastors that can come alongside and comfort the sheep. You know what I'm saying? All right. So, 
So we need the pastor pastors in the church. We need them desperately. Number, the second thing is the teacher, the minister, the teacher. Uh, well, I had some. I was going to show you uh, the minister, the teacher. According to First Corinthians chapter three, Paul said, "I have planted because that's what apostles do. They build and they plant." Okay. But he said, Apollos watered. Paul said, I planted. Because in the church at the time, you see, they were saying, some of them were saying, well, I'm of Paul. And others said, well, I'm of Apollos. Paulus is my man, you know. Doesn't say Paul is my man. So there must have been a difference in them. What you got here is a difference of ministry. And the church didn't know how to, how to separate them or how to flow with both of them. That's why we're doing this teaching tonight. He said, Paul said, I'm the planter. I planted. But Apollos, now Apollos, you can read these scriptures. I don't have time to get it, but Apollos, according to Acts 15, starting in verse 32, Apollos was a teacher. So what do teachers do? They water. Well, they can't water. If you just water the ground, you're not going to get anything. But you, when something is planted, so what do the teachers do? The teachers take what the apostle has planted, see, and they water it. How do they water it? See, I've, I've told y'all different times, and, and Linda's doing that on, on Wednesday night now, the teacher. I said, all right, here, here's the thing. I'm going to bring revelation. I'm going to say what God is saying. But then the teacher comes along and, what, and, and explains it. In other words, they take the seed that I've sown and planted and they begin to water it. Let me, how they do that? Well, look at some of these words. What do they do? They explain. They explain. They take the revelation that's just been shared because I don't know if you noticed it or not, but very seldom, just like tonight, I've got all these verses, but I did not take time to read them. I hit things, I hit the high spots, and I keep going. I, I don't know why I've been trying for years to get myself to slow down and read every verse, but I can't do it because I've always got somewhere else to go. But a teacher can do it. You see what I'm saying? So now we found out that the teacher is important, and we need it because the revelation that comes through the apostle is not going to be established until somebody teaches it. And so they explain, they train, they instruct, they educate people in the Word, they simplify. Teachers don't make something hard to understand. Teachers make it simple so that a child can understand it. Uh, they are instruments of, of maturity. They tutor. Uh, steps, keys, and how-tos. That's important to the teacher. The teacher, and, and I've got a lot of teacher in me from the standpoint that I'm, I, oh my goodness, I, 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 I looked over, they were having a praise-a-thon. So I looked at the TV the other day just to see what was on, and they had this guy out there preaching. Oh, Jesus. God's going to do this and God's going to do that. You're right before your breakthrough. God's going to do this. God's going to do that. God's going to do the other. And I'm sitting down thinking, no, he's not. He's not going to do it. If he was going to do it, why hadn't he already done it? I tell you, God's going God's to gonna bless you so much. God's going to do this, that, and the other. And, and see, the, okay, yeah, well, if he does, tell me something. How's he going to do it? How do I position myself for it? How, how, what price do I have to pay? So I'm just going along, staying the same, just being me, just tiptoeing through the tulips, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, God's just going to, he's just going to bring his blessings and power down on me. My ministry is just going to explode, and I'm, you know, I'm just going to be rich and, and blessed and famous and all of this stuff. And you can't even tell me how to do it. How do I get that? Because if I, was, if I was prepared for it, I'd already have it. Amen. 
If I was ready for it, I'd already have it. So what kind of, what kind of, what are you going to have if you don't have the teachers in the church telling you that step one is you got to do this. Step two, you got, they, teachers like that stuff, you know, the steps, principles, you know, and, and, but do we need teachers in the church? Yes. Absolutely. When it comes to see church is not going to mature without these gifts. You're not going to make it on your own. You, you, we got to have keys and we got to have steps and, you know, these kinds of things. All right, the evangelist. Um, oh, if I had time, but I'm running out of time. Philip is the evangelist. Let me tell you where to go read if you want to read about the evangelist. The ministry of the evangelist is found in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. And then in Acts 21, uh, Philip is called the evangelist. Okay, Acts 21, 8, he's called the evangelist. Paul wrote to Timothy in, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, and said, Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Notice he didn't t- call him an evangelist. He was an apostle in training. He told him to do the work of an evangelist. All of us should be doing the work of an evangelist because the work of the evangelist is, is, is this. Let me, let me give you these words. Uh, souls. We, they want to win souls. They think so. The, the lost. They think about the lost. Does this remind you anybody you know? Huh? Uh, the gospel. People need the God. good news. A herald. A, a, a preacher. See? Uh, glad tidings is the same as good news and and the gospel. Salvation. See? Uh, uh, the great commission, go ye into all the world. Also, if you talk to Orlando, the evangelist of this house, this is, you're going to hear these, this is what comes out of him. Because this is what's in him. You see what I'm saying? And see, and not, now also this, signs and wonders. Orlando won't see signs and wonders. I mean, he, 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 he lives for that. That's, that's what he's supposed to do because he's an evangelist. But if you want to read about an evangelist, you read Acts chapter 8, and you find out that Philip the evangelist went down to Samaria and was preaching Christ and had a great uh, revival. And, but as soon as the apostles heard what was going on, they sent Peter and John down there. Why? Because the ministry and the anointing of the evangelist is to get people saved and to get them healed and get devils out of them. But see, at the same time, Philip was down there. He didn't get any of them filled with the Holy Ghost. The apostles went down there and got them filled with the Holy Ghost. Not only that, but there was a sorcerer in the church named Simeon. And, and, and the evangelist, Philip, hadn't dealt with him. See? See, apostles deal with this stuff. And so he went down there, they, Peter and John, the apostle, went down there, dealt with Simeon, and then got to all the people filled with the Holy Ghost. So you see the two ministries working there, right? All right, moving right along. Then the ministry of the prophet. Um, the ministry of the prophet uh, is not what a lot of people think it is. It's just not somebody goes around giving words to everybody. You can't even find that in the Bible. You can't find anybody lining a whole line up and prophesying over everybody. It's just not in the scripture. These things that happened when you see God moving through the prophet, a lot of the times, a lot of times, when uh, when, when supernatural things happen, it, 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 one or two things happened over a period of years. Hello, I mean, when you read the Old Testament, you think, "Well, there's a miracle on every page." If you go back through there, you see that. Um, I don't know how old Elisha lived. I don't know how old he was when he died, but I think it was only, he only had 17 miracles. And Elisha had a double portion. He had 34 in his lifetime. But we get in our mind that we're supposed to have one every day. We don't live by miracles. You live by faith. Amen. So, you know, you don't need a prophetic word every day. <laughs> you don't need a prophecy every day. Hello. Because you're led by the Spirit. You, you have the Spirit of God in you. Isn't that right? Yes. But the prophet, the prophet, and if you want to read about the ministry of the prophet, Silas and uh, Judas were prophets. Let me see where that's at. Acts 15, 32. 
And it says that they exhorted the churches and they confirmed the churches. In other words, see the ministry of the prophet. Now notice it's churches, not parking lots. Amen. The, the prophet's not to be in the parking lot. He's be in the church. His ministry's in the church. And the ministry of the prophet is to confirm supernaturally the revelation given to the apostle. Are we all right? Words that are associated with the prophet is number one, see or seer. They're called seers in the Old Testament. You know. Prophets see things and know things supernaturally, not naturally. It's not that they uh, have seen it so much that they recognize it. No, it's a supernatural thing. They have the ability to hear God. They hear from God. They hear God speak. And they speak. They're God's mouthpiece. God's messenger. They're also called watchmen. And why? Because they warn. They see things in the spirit. They know things before it happens. And they warn the church. They pick things up in their spirit, see. I mean, everybody is shouting and having a wonderful time, but the prophet's sitting over there seeing something we ain't seeing. So he ain't shouting too much. <laughs> Revelation comes to the prophet. They decree, prophets decree and proclaim. Prophets um, they make announcements, supernatural announcements. See, John the Baptist was the prophet. He announced the coming of Jesus. They, they make prophetic announcements. They, they prepare the way with their, with their message. Now, when I say prophets, remember now, I'm not talking about getting up and prophesying. I'm talking about their preachers. And they preach a little different because they're not teaching Bible lessons. They are speaking by divine inspiration. See, I've seen this on Orlando several times. They begin to speak by divine or by inspiration of the moment. They may study and pray and prepare, but then when they stand up before the people, what they studied and what they prepared is not necessarily what's going to come because they're speaking by inspiration of the moment. You hear prophets talk about burden because things will be on them heavy until they deliver that word. Um, now, prophets, if you're really prophet, walking in your prophetic gift, then all prophets are prayers. They pray a lot. You have to stay prayed up to operate in the supernatural. Um, They're intercessors. They call for repentance. They're strong on holiness, deliverance. They have dreams and visions, and they call the body of Christ. To, they, they preach against sin. Boy, nobody wants to do that anymore. We don't want that. We don't want that. All right, now the apostle. You got five more minutes? Words that are associated with apostle are words like this. Impart. They impart. Romans chapter 1. Activate. You can have a, a gifting or an anointing on your life and you come into the presence of the apostle and the anointing that's on the apostle and that gift will begin to be activated. And that's why many people in this house are in a, walking in anointing and have giftings manifest in their life now that they never did anywhere else. And they've been other places and it didn't flow through them. But when they came here, then that anointing activated what was in them. Apostles strengthen people. Apostles receive strategies from God. Apostles are strong. You're going to hear them talk about the church a lot. They're strong 
where the local church is concerned. You're going to hear apostles talk about design and plans and structure. And the reason is because they're builders. And to build, you have to have design. You have to have structure. You have to have plan. Apostles ordain other ministers. Apostles are reformers. They restore things that have been deformed. If, uh, there's a lot of things in the church that's been deformed, but they reform it. Proton, which means first. Here's another word that people don't like, but this is, this is what happens. Their anointing puts a demand on people. Puts a demand. Just the anointing, just the impartation, just the message puts a demand on people. Well, the pastor is going to be nurturing them. He's going to be loving on them. He's going to be edifying them. He's going to be blessing them. The apostle is going to put a demand on them. All right, let's go. Let's, you, you, you know, let's grow up. Amen. Let's change. Let's do what we need to do. Doctrine. Oh, boy, we're strong for doctrine. The apostle can't stand people to, to, to twist scriptures and, uh, and get off into false doctrine. Another word is administrate and father. Remember we said that the apostle sees people as children and children or sons and daughters. They have to be trained. Train up a child in the way they'll go and they'll depart. So we have to, apostle, his, his mission is to train the people. Not just to see after them, not just to nurture them, not just to protect them, not just to make life comfortable for them. That's the ministry of the pastor. The ministry of the apostle is to train them. And you know, there's a lot that goes into training. Governing is, govern is another word. Uh, govern. Uh, pioneer. Because they're go, go, go first ministries. Trailblazer. Apostles are trailblazers. They're foundation layers. They are sent ones. Warriors. They're messengers. Order is another word that goes with the apostolic. Now see, I'm a builder. And we build structure. But now, if I build a structure, the structure is built out of what? People. People. So what if I build a structure, but the people in the structure are weak? You got a weak structure. So what, when it says we're builders, what we have to build first? We have to build you. You got to build the people. You got to get them strong. They've got to be a polished stone. They can't be in just any old stone in the house of God. We can't put up rotten two befores. Amen. You have to put up, I mean, we can't put a two before where there needs to be a two but ten. Isn't that right? So we have to build the people. And then the people fit into the structure and we can create the house of God. Y'all get anything out of this? All right. Praise God. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been my privilege to serve you tonight. Apostle David, uh, yeah. Kathy's home. Yeah, good. She's very uncomfortable right now, and uh, she doesn't need a lot of company. She doesn't need a lot of calls. Right. Uh, she said if, if you just uh, put something on her, face, what do you call it, timeline or whatever it is. Her what? Facebook, okay. Yeah, but she, we've talked to her several times a day. She is home. Okay. Uh, does everybody understand what's going on with Kathy? You know, you understand what she's going through. Okay. Uh, I, I, that, that, I'm sorry, it hurts me, but let's pray for her right now. Well, Father, we lift up Kathy to you. Yes, Father. And Lord, we didn't, we didn't get your best in this situation, but that doesn't change you. 
and your grace is still sufficient. Lord, for where she is and for right now, your grace is sufficient. I just, we just lift up. This is her family. This is her church. Yes. We lift her up before you right now. Yes. And we pray right now in the name of Jesus that angels would just go surround yes. her bed yes. and minister to her. Yes. And Father God, that the covering, the yes. covering and, the, and yes. the comfort of the Holy Ghost would be real in her life right now. And that the scripture where Jesus said he carried our pains, that it would be real in her body right now. I pray that her body will, will uh, recuperate, that she yes. will be healed, that she will recover supernaturally. And I pray God, I, re, I thank you the Holy Ghost lives in her and the Holy Ghost does his part in her. And my Father, I thank you that the angels, we send them now, go and ministering spirits and minister to Kathy. And Lord, we just surround her tonight with our faith and with our love. And, and we thank you, Lord God, that the next report will be a good report. Yes. We lift up Barry, Lord. We know he must be going through some tough stuff right now. But we speak over his heart and life, over his mind, over their home, the very peace of God that passes all understanding. And we thank you for that, oh God. We thank you for your reality. Yes. Lord, we lift up the Walter family again. Lord, have they have lost this young man. It's, Lord, we just cover that family. We pray for not only just the family, but those closest to him, mother, father, the brothers, sisters, whatever's involved, oh God, we pray supernatural comfort and strength. And Lord, for all those uh, children, those uh, teenagers, even the ones in this church, Father, we just pray that your presence and your reality would be uh, just so real to them, Father God, that it would affect them. Uh, Lord, in a, in a positive way. And Lord, we'll just thank you for all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God.